Hello guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. It is Tutor Med and on this channel everything medicine is simplified. And as usual, my name is Dr. Kofi. I am a medical practitioner with keen interest in teaching everything medicine. So this video is actually a follow-up to our discussion on CSF analysis and interpretation. In this video, we will see some questions and answers on the interpretation of CSF analysis results or reports to help consolidate our knowledge on the topic. And so, I strongly recommend that you watch our video on how to interpret CSF analysis reports before continuing with this question and answer session. Ready? Grab your notepads and let's begin. Very good. And so there are five questions in all, some basic science questions and then some clinical questions. And so let's look at question one. Question one says, the main anatomical structure which produces CSF is called the A is the cerebellum, B is the choroid plexus, C is foramen of Monroe, D for cerebrum and E for amygdala. And so let's take some seconds to think through this question and then guess the answer. And so if you are thinking that the answer is option B, choroid plexus, then you are right. Now, this is a picture of the sagittal section of the brain, the brainstem, and the upper part of the spinal cord. The first option, cerebellum, is a structure located here behind the brainstem. This part of the brain is responsible for coordination, equilibrium, and balance. It does not produce CSF. Then let's skip option B, sorry, and go to option C. The foramen of Monroe. What is this foramen? Now, from our previous video, you know that this is the lateral ventricle. And actually, there are two ventricles, two lateral ventricles, if you remember. And then, this is the third ventricle. I label the lateral ventricle as LV and the third ventricle as TV. Now, the CSF flows from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe as I have indicated with this red circle, the foramen of Monroe. So the foramen of Monroe is the foramen through which the CSF flows from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle and so it does not produce CSF. Then option D, the cerebrum. The cerebrum is that part of the brain which is made up of the frontal lobe, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital lobe. And so the seat of consciousness is there, the cortex which interprets visual images is there, the cortex which interprets memory, hearing, are all located in the cerebrum. And so it does not produce CSF. Then the amygdala is not shown in this picture, but it is a structure which is part of the limbic system, the system which helps us generate our emotions so the amygdala helps us to generate i mean to feel afraid the sense of fear is in the amygdala and it does not produce the csf so the structure which produces the csf is actually within each of the ventricles it is called the choroid plexus and it is indicated by this red structure as labeled so the choroid plexus is in the lateral ventricle it is found also in the third ventricle and it is found in the fourth ventricle. Then let's look at question two. Question two says, the greatest volume of CSF is contained within the A, lateral ventricles. B, we have the third ventricle. C, the fourth ventricle. And then D, the subarachnoid space. Which of these options contains the greatest volume of the CSF produced?
If your answer is option D, the subarachnoid space, then that is the correct answer. Now remember that the choroid plexus is located in each of the ventricles and it produces fluid called the CSF. And the CSF flows through each of the ventricles and exits the ventricular system into the subarachnoid space through the foramen of Lushka and then Magendi. Now, the subarachnoid space fluid is more than the fluid which is within the ventricles. Actually, the fluid within the brain or the total CSF volume is about 90 to 200 mLs of CSF. Of this, the ventricles contain only 20% 20, 20 of the CSF volume and then the rest of the 80 is found in the subarachnoid space. And so the answer is option D, subarachnoid space. Now question 3. Question 3 says, which of the following CSF results suggests fungal meningitis? A. Elevated CSF neutrophil count, raised protein, and low glucose. Option B. Elevated protein, and then a CSF lymphocyte count of 20 lymphocytes per microliter, and the normal glucose. Then option C, moderately elevated CSF lymphocyte count of 200 cells per microliter, and then raised protein and low glucose. Which of these three suggests a fungal meningitis? If your answer is C, then that is a correct answer. And so here basically, like I said in the previous video, we are being asked of the Mokpasi of fungal meningitis. But they just give us the C component, which is a cell, the P component, which is the raised, sorry, the protein, and then the G component, which is glucose. And so let's look at A, option A, elevated CSF neutrophil count, raised protein, and then low glucose. Which type of meningitis do you think this fits? If you are thinking it is bacterial, that is a correct answer. Remember, we said that for bacteria, the cells which be elevated is neutrophils. Even from our full blood count lecture, neutrophils are predominantly raised in bacterial infections. Then there will be a raised protein level. Why? Because bacteria are able to generate proteinaceous inflammatory exudates. That is how I like to think about it. Then low glucose. Why low glucose? Because the bacteria need the glucose within the CSF to multiply. Then let's look at option B. Elevated proteins, 20 lymphocytes per microliter and normal glucose. What picture does this fit? If you are thinking of a viral picture, then you are right. So elevated protein, yes, viruses can give you a normal or elevated protein levels. But the lymphocyte count here gave viral meningitis away. Remember that lymphocyte count can also be found in fungal and then tuberculosis. But what made it viral actually is the normal glucose. And so fungal meningitis would have elevated protein, elevated lymphocyte count, but the glucose will not be normal. And so the fact that the glucose is normal, that is what made this a viral instead of a fungal. But if you watch the option C, you'll see that we have an elevated lymphocyte count of 200 cells per microliter. So lymphocyte is both or can be tuberculosis, viral, and then fungal. And then we are told that the CSF contains proteins, very raised. So that speaks for the three of them. But the low glucose speaks for the fungal or tuberculosis. But the question is asking us about fungal. So option C is the answer. Now let's look at question 4. Question 4 says, which of the following is true about the CSF changes in patients with tuberculosis meningitis? Option A, the cell count is often elevated and the cells are mainly neutrophils. 
Option B, in detecting mycobacterium tuberculosis in the CSF by nucleic acid amplification tests, example, using the gene expert test, the sensitivity and specificity are close to 100%. Then option C says, a normal CSF does not exclude cerebral TB. Which of the following statements is true about tuberculous meningitis? If you are thinking that the answer is C, then you are right. And so, let's look at option A. The cell count is often elevated all right, but the cells are mainly not neutrophils. They are lymphocytes. Remember that sometimes they can be a mixed picture, neutrophils and the lymphocytes, but normally, mainly, they are lymphocytes. Then option B, in detecting mycobacterium tuberculosis with nucleic acid amplification tests like GeneSpect, the sensitivity and specificity are not close to 100%. They are almost 50% specific and sensitive and so close to 100% is a wrong answer and it is true that a normal CSF does not exclude cerebral TB. Please take note of that. It is true that using the Mopasi, you would have M, you, you can have a positive gene expert, you can have a positive ZN stain when we stain for acid fast bacilli, you can have elevated proteins, opening pressure might be high and all that, but a normal CSF does not exclude cerebral tuberculosis. Now let's look at question 5. Question 5 says, a 21-year-old man presented to the ER with a two-day history of headache and fever. On exam, he had neck stiffness and fever but no obvious rash or focal neurological deficits. And he was given IV keftriazone and the lumbar puncture, an LP, was performed. Now the CSF analysis came and showed protein of 0.3 grams per liter in milligram per DL. This is the same as 30 milligram per DL. Then we have glucose, which is about two thirds of the plasma level and so this is somewhat normal and the protein is also normal then the cells on microscopy showed 300 white blood cells which are predominantly lymphocytes and so based on this information the most diagnosis sorry the most likely diagnosis is but let's go through the question the fact that he came with a two-day history of fever and headache and hard neck stiffness should, should raise a suspicion of meningitis to us. The fact that it was reported that he had no obvious rash makes meningococcal meningitis less likely and there was no focal neurological deficit. And he was given IV keftriazone, LP was done. And so, look at this CSF analysis report. What do you think the picture um, I mean, paints. This picture paints a viral meningitis, if you ask me. Remember that in viral meningitis, the glucose will be normal, to not be reduced. And then the proteins may be normal or elevated. But in this picture, we have elevated, sorry, normal proteins. And the white cell count was what? Lymphocytes. And so that made it viral. If it were TB or fungal, the proteins would have been elevated and then the glucose would have gone down. But the fact that the proteins are normal, glucose are normal, sorry, glucose is normal, then it makes this picture viral meningitis. But let's look at the possible answers. Let's look at the MCQs. And so for the possible answers, we have A, adenovirus meningitis. B. Enteroviral meningitis C. Herpes simplex meningitis D. Meningococcal meningitis E. Tuberculous meningitis So which is the answer? You, you would understand that 
Options A, B, and C are all forms of viral meningitis, and so it kind of complicates the situation a bit. But what is the answer? As for meningococcal meningitis, the fact that there is no rash and then the CSF picture does not support it at all. Tuberculous meningitis to the CSF picture does not support it. And so we know that the answer is among the first three, A, B, or C, but which is the answer? And so the correct answer is option, yes, what do you think? Option B, the answer is enteroviral meningitis. It is simply because enteroviral meningitis is one of the most common causes of viral meningitis. Adenovirus and herpes simplex also causes meningitis. But if you are to place your money behind one of the three, would go for enteroviral meningitis because among the three, it is the fairly common one. And so on this slide, let me summarize the approach to interpreting the CSF report. So the first approach or the first step is always have a sound background history. We've been emphasizing this point anytime we, we discuss any lab investigation that before you interpret any lab investigation, make sure you have a sound background history. Then the second step is to get the relevant physical examination. Then the third step is to go through the report with MOCFA C, that mnemonic in your head. So you go through what does the CSF report say about the microbiology, what does it say about the opening pressure, how about the glucose content? How about the protein content? The appearance? And then see for the cell type and count. By doing this, you'd have a fair idea of which kind of meningitis um, the picture or the CSF report is showing. And it can even tell you if there is subarachnoid hemorrhage using the same principle. And so thank you for watching this episode once again. Please do not forget to like and share this video and subscribe to our channel if you have not done that yet. Bye!